time I looked at four proverbs, all written by Solomon, and they're all linked by a particular phrase. That phrase is tree of life. And so within these four proverbs, Solomon has equated various things as being a tree of life. The tree of life is all about giving life. In Revelation, it talks about it being of healing. And so these four proverbs have got something very important within them. The things mentioned are life-giving. And therefore they have significance, they have importance. The first one is Proverbs 3.18, which says, She, which is wisdom, is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Though those who hold her fast will be blessed. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and the one who is wise saves lives. Proverbs 13.12, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And Proverbs 15.4 says, The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. And as we learnt last time, that phrase, soothing tongue, if you go to the Orthodox Jewish Bible, it's called a tongue of healing, because the word translated soothing there is often translated healing in the Old Testament. So there's probably a lot encompassed within these phrases, and I really only touched the surface of them. But this morning I want to look at one of these particular proverbs and what's contained within it, and it's hope. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope fulfilled is a tree of life. There is something about hope which is incredibly important. It's life-giving. And Proverbs 13, 12 says that hope that doesn't come to pass sort of cripples us, makes the heart sick. The heart is always the sort of the inner personality, the real you. But a longing, a hope fulfilled is a tree of life. So there is something about hope, and especially hopes that come to fruition, hopes that are fulfilled. They're a tree of life. Solomon says. Solomon was the wisest person who's ever lived. Therefore, it does us good to take on board what he says. There is real meaning to these four particular proverbs. And this one I want to have a look at. I want to look at hope from a New Testament point of view. There are about over 80 verses that mention the word hope in the New Testament, either hope, hoped, hopes. And there's about 60 that have the word hope. And uh, if you look at all these verses that deal with hope, um, they come at it from different angles, they cover off different things. And as I was thinking about this, I thought, well, how do you sort of cover the subject of hope? in a sort of a bit of a nutshell. And the verse that we're going to go to later, I'm just going to sidetrack. If we go to the next slide. 1 Corinthians 13:13. 13, 13, this would be a familiar verse to most Christians. And it says this, uh, this and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. These three remain, faith, hope, and love. You'll find that these three, faith, hope, and love, occur quite a lot in the New Testament. They seem to be the sort of the triune message that Paul brings. He will often talk about faith, hope, and love. They are incredibly important within the Christian life. They are incredibly important to us. And Solomon knew that because he said a hope that comes to realization is a tree of life. There's something about hope. And so, as I say, this is one of the, probably the most familiar verses that talks about hope. Paul says these three are important. These three remain. Faith, hope, and love. If we go to the next slide, the word hope 
in the Greek is the word elpis. Uh, it comes from a primary word, which I won't try and <laughs> say. And this is what Strong's says the definition of this Greek word is all about. To anticipate, usually with pleasure, expectation <laughs> or confidence, faith, hope. An expectation is associated with this Greek word. A confidence is associated with the Greek word. And that's an important thing to realise because the English word hope doesn't have that. The English word hope always has a degree of uncertainty with it. I hope something happens, but it might not, is implied within the English word. But you do not get that in the Greek it's an expectation, it's a confidence. It will happen. So this is one of the words which is translated, uh, one of the Greek words that is translated hope. If we go to the next verse, this is another familiar verse. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That comes from Hebrews 11.1. 1. So faith is confidence in what we hope for. And the next slide, that word hope, is a slightly different Greek word. It's elpizo, <coughs> but it's derived from the previous Greek word that we looked at, so it's associated with that Greek word. To expect or confide, to have a thing hoped for, or it can mean trust, and sometimes it's translated trust. But it shows that there is a connection between hope and trust as well. So these are the two Greek words. There's a confidence about it. There's an expectation. There's a trust involved. But as it says there, it's to expect something. You're expecting something to happen. And the Greek implies a certainty with it. It's not, uh, well, it might happen, it might not. If you use the Greek word for hope, you were expecting it to happen. And there would be no sense, oh, it won't happen. So as I say, there are quite a lot of word, uh, verses in the New Testament that talk about hope. And I thought, well, how am I going to sort of try and get a message out? How am I going to get it out in a nutshell? What verse or verses can I tie together to sort of make sense? To simplify it. And this was amazing. The Lord brought the next verse to me. Supernaturally one morning this verse came into my mind. And what's even more astounding is, and it's happened a few times now, is you get a, an instant understanding of the verse. It's supernatural. It is quite powerful when it happens. And I find it amazing when the Lord does that. He just plants a verse and he plants the understanding. And it happens in a fraction of a second. Um, there's something I suppose perhaps preachers are privileged to be able to have. It's that distinct word you get and it's understanding. And this verse is not a verse you would immediately think would teach you a lot about hope. But it does. But you have to dig. And you have to understand what Paul is getting at when he cites this verse. He's writing it to Timothy. And what he says, he says to Timothy, Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. The Lord brought this verse across my path several years ago, and that bit at the end, God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. I thought this is probably one of the most unreligious verses in the Bible. Does God richly provide us with everything for our enjoyment? Is that what he wants to do? And I can guarantee this, but if you, find, if you look at any other versions, it is distinctly that. This verse, that part of that verse cannot be misinterpreted. Whatever translation you go to, however you look at that Greek word for enjoyment, I think it only occurs once in the New Testament anyway, but it is enjoyment. Some translate it as pleasure. God wants us to enjoy our life. 
That is a radical statement within religious circles. God wants us to enjoy our life. He richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. This verse is so unreligious. It is amazing. And I just thought this is a staggering thing. So anybody who you know as a non-Christian says, well, God is a killjoy, point them to this verse. But that's the sidetrack. What I want to look at is hope. And hope is mentioned twice in this verse. And Paul writes, he says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Now, to understand this verse, you will have to put yourself into the position of a very wealthy person. It used to be that if you were a millionaire, you were considered wealthy. That seems a bit blasé these days. It seems to be a billionaire is the sort of the status. But for the sake of argument, put yourself into the position of being very wealthy. You've got millions and millions of pounds at your disposal. You have that. And these are, this is the type of person that Paul is addressing. He is addressing the rich and the wealthy. He is addressing the people who have a lot of money. And what he says to them is, says, do not put your hope in that wealth. Now, a person who has lots of money, what can they do with lots of money? Well, they can buy a house. They can buy food. They can buy a car. They can buy heating, electricity, water. They can buy clothes. But that's not just the wealthy. We can do that as well. We can buy houses. We can buy food. We can buy clothes. So that's not exclusive to the wealthy, this buying houses and clothes and food. They may buy better houses, they may buy more houses, they may buy better cars, more cars, etc. But fundamentally, they can do what we do. We buy houses, we rent houses, we buy food, we buy clothes, electricity, gas, water. We do that, and the rich do that. My dad often quoted his father about wealthy people and his granddad was quite well off but my granddad said it doesn't matter how rich you are you can only sleep in one bed you can only drive one car and you can only live under one roof it is completely irrelevant how much money you've got those three aspects are true they will be true for the rich the super rich the very rich and they're true for us you can do that but Paul is obviously addressing a particular group of people, and I think he's doing it for a very particular reason, because he brings, he's trying to bring out a point. What can the wealthy do that general Joe public can't do? Well, take education. They can buy private education for their children. I was looking online. The average fees in a year for private education in this country are around about the twelve to £14,000 a year. That's not for boarding, that's just going for day school. Twelve to fourteen thousand pounds a year. And the average wage in this country is now about twenty seven thousand pounds a year. And that's not including taxes, national insurance. So very few people in this country can afford private education for their child, and they certainly would have trouble providing private education for children because of the colossal amount of money. But to the rich or the super rich, that's not a problem. They have the money. They can put their children into private education. A fact that I came across was that in the civil service, 50% of people who work in the civil service have had private education. So the people who can afford it, they sort of become a bit privileged, really. But that's what people with lots of money can do. They can buy private education. What else can the super rich do? Well, they can buy their private planes and they can buy their private yachts. For them, there's no internet booking on a British Airways flight. Having to go through passport control, they will just go up to their private plane, they will get it and they will have their own pilot and they will just go wherever they want. That is the domain of the rich. They could do that. You and I... Well, as far as I know, none of you can do that. 
I certainly can't do it. What else can the super rich do? Well, another area where they have access is health care, medical attention. If they have a problem, physical problem, a health problem, a disease, whatever may come their way, they have enough money to go for private health care. I can guarantee that they will not wait or have to wait over four hours to get into accident and emergency. They have got money to get into a private hospital very quickly, when they want. They have got access to private doctors, private hospitals, private surgeons, private this, private that. They can afford the most expensive drugs. There's no limit to what they can do. Because they know in their money, with their money, they have access to private health care. They will not queue. They will not wait. They will get things done very quickly. They have access to the expensive medication. That is what the wealthy can do. We cannot do that. If we have a problem, we will have to wait over four hours at West Suffolk Hospital. We will have to do that. People with a lot of money don't. And so Paul here is addressing those who are rich. He's addressing those who have plenty of money who in any given situation that occurs in their life, they can sort it or attempt to sort it with money. They will throw money at the problem. They will throw money at the situation because they have it. They can, uh, they can do it. There's no problem with it. So it doesn't matter what occurs in their life, they will use their money to sort that situation or to solve that problem or to handle whatever comes up. They have that capability. But Paul says here, what does he say? He says, command those who are rich. Firstly, he says, command them not to be arrogant. It's interesting, it's a command not to be arrogant. You can choose, I can choose to be arrogant or not. Because if you can be commanded not to do it, then it must be under our control. But th the important thing he says here that I want to emphasize is he says, command those who are rich not to put their hope in wealth. The King James says trust. Their trust, their hope in wealth. Why does Paul say that? Well, he goes on to explain. He says, because it's uncertain. Hope in wealth is uncertain. That's a very important aspect. People who have money can often lose that money. There are many stories of people who have made significant amounts of money and have lost it just as quickly or very quickly compared to the time it's taken to gain it. And I was looking online, and it's amazing how many people have actually lost millions and millions of pounds. Very famous people have just lost fortunes. Very famous people who've got a lot of wealth have lost a lot of money in the process. And that's what Paul is saying here. He said, the trouble with money is it's uncertain. You can have it one minute. You can have loads of it one minute. But through misfortune, through mistakes through theft, through robbery, through a, f a failing stock market, whatever, what you have one day financially, you may not have another day. It is uncertain. But there's also an aspect of this that money is uncertain. Even if you've got money, it can still be uncertain. If you take the situation of health care, just because you have lots of money, it does not guarantee that your particular problem will be solved. There is a prime example of this actually in the Gospels and it's the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' cloak because it was said of her, she had an issue of blood, but Jesus said of her that she had spent all her money on doctors and was none the better for it. Money could not solve her problem. And there are other people who have 
spent fortunes trying to solve health problems and the money has been of no use whatsoever. I was, uh, I sort of follow what Andrew Womack does and he was citing an example of somebody who came to one of his meetings in the States and she had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on a health problem she had and it had not solved her problem. Came to the meeting and she was healed. You see, it doesn't matter how much money you've got, there will be situations in life where your money will not solve the problem. It goes beyond it. And what Paul says is very true. He says the trouble with wealth is it's uncertain. It is uncertain. But then what does Paul tell the rich to do? He says, put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. Now why would Paul say that? Because rich people are very dependent upon their wealth. They will use their wealth to handle whatever comes along. But Paul says here, the trouble is it's uncertain. There's no guarantee with your wealth that you'll keep it or that it will, you'll be able to use it to sort out a situation that occurs in your life. Therefore, put your hope on, in God. Now, what is Paul implying by this statement? He doesn't say it here. You have to deduce it. Hope in wealth is uncertain. But hope in God is what? Certain. That is an incredibly important aspect of hope from a New Testament perspective. Hope in God is certain. Now, we may not know that to be true in our own lives. That's down to us. That's not down to God. Because that is what Paul is getting at in this verse. Look at it this way. A very rich person who has a health problem, I'm taking health as an example because it's one that's a bit of a sticking point, I think, to Christians. If a rich person has a health problem and they have loads of money and they try to solve their health problem through financial means, what is Paul saying here? Paul is saying, well, you can try, but there's no guarantee that that will work. There's no certainty associated with it. So what should the rich person do when he has a health problem? Paul is actually saying, put your hope in God. Because in God, there is a certainty. Wealth is uncertain. God is certain. In any situation that you'll find in life, and this is what Paul is getting at here, no matter how much money you've got, there's an uncertainty with it. But by implication, Paul is saying, put your hope in God. Because what is uncertain? Wealth. You're replacing it with something that is certain. God. This is a very powerful verse talking about Christian hope. That Christian hope placed in God from this verse, Paul is saying, is a certain hope. As I say, am I at the place where I can totally and completely believe this verse? I waver. But that doesn't stop this verse being true. Just because I may have problems with it, or I may find it difficult in certain areas, doesn't stop the message, the truth of this verse, being true. It doesn't stop what Paul is getting at being true. That wealth is uncertain, but God is certain. That is where the Lord wants us to get to. Where we are so dependent on him, so trusting him, so hoping in him that we know in whatever situation crops up in life, he is the God of certainty. That our hope is in a God who is certain. 
So the question remains. We go on to the next slide. Hope. Our hope. Is it certain or uncertain? I can guarantee you that if we're honest with ourselves, there are situations in life where we will still do what the wealthy people do. We will try and solve the problem financially. Well, according to what Paul says, he says that's an uncertain way of doing things. There's no guarantee with that. If we understood it properly, if we could ever get to that point, I think, in our lives, God guarantees. God is certain. God can handle any situation that crops up in our life, according to that verse in Timothy. Because otherwise, it's a pointless verse. Most people, even probably most Christians, I think, will probably go the financial route quicker than they will go the God route. And yet Paul says there's no certainty with that. It's uncertain. But Paul is saying when you go with God, you have a certain hope. Yeah, that's the point I want to get to in my life, where I just know my hope in God is certain. No matter what situation, I am confident. I am fully assured. It means involving our faith because as that verse in Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Faith is the confidence. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's why faith and hope are, are linked in that 1 Corinthians 13 chapter. And that's why the Greek word for hope also in some cases implies trust. You've got faith, you've got hope, you've got trust, you've got confidence, you've got expectation, all within it. This is the biblical view. This is what Paul says. And... May we take it as truth. May not quite be our experience, but that doesn't stop what Paul says of God being true. So the question to all of us is, well, what is our hope? Where is our hope? What type of hope do we have? Do we have a certain hope or an uncertain hope? Amen.